All right. So for the sake of time and to um, to um, to to get started today, we just want to thank everyone for joining us um, today. You have joined the Michigan Opioid Collaboratives Friday webinar on xylazine. Um, and we want to thank everyone for being here um, and for joining us and taking the, your, the time out of your day to be with us um, during this time. Um, just a few housekeeping um, messages. Um, please just make sure that you are muted. Um, and um, if you have questions, please feel free to utilize the chat function, the raise hand function, um, or during our Q&A answers at the end, feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask questions. But we do ask that while our speaker is speaking, if you could utilize the chat and the raise hand function, that would be wonderful. Um, I want to bring your attention to the screen. Um, we have a couple options today for our credits. Um, if you're a medical professional looking for CMEs, um, please um, see the PDF that will be put in the chat as well as an email that will be sent out afterwards. There's also a QR code here on your screen. Um, social workers that need their social work credits and those looking for MCBAP credits. Um, also, please see all the information regarding our um, continuing education credits um, that you see here on the screen as well. Um, for those that are looking for just a certificate of attendance or don't fall under the social work MCBAP or um, medical professional CEs, um, there is an option to register yourself with EADS and that will um, send you to a survey and allow you to get the certifi certificate of completion as well. And we at MOC can also send a blank certificate of, um, of participation today if you would like that as well. Um, and we can help we can help navigate that as well. But we just wanted to be a little bit clear about our um, the credits for today. Um, and we, we hope that um, that can clear up kind of any questions that folks might have. Um, we're very excited to have Claire with us today. Um, she's going to be our presenter and we'll introduce her here in a moment. Um, if you haven't already, um, please enter your chat, your name, your email, and your organization in the chat. Um, we would love to be able to share this presentation with you and other materials after our um, webinar today. And so in order to do that, we would love to have everyone sign in um, so that we know you're here as well and uh, make sure we get you those materials. Um, just quickly before we move on um, to our wonderful speaker, I want to share just a bit about the Michigan Opioid Collaborative, and it won't take too long today. Um, our website, www.michiganopioidcollaborative.org, is full of information, has great links. Um, see our events tab on our website as well um, with all of our upcoming events. Um, and then um, join our YouTube um, video, our YouTube channel um, for previous um, seminars and webinars that we've done to learn, um, learn more and um, to um, take, a, take a look at that. Um, one of the things we do here at the Michigan Opioid Collaborative is our same day consultation services. We have addiction specialists um, on our team who um, provide our consultation services um, from Monday through Friday, nine to five. And we would love to um, love to be able to offer those services to you free of charge. Um, our sign up is also on the website. So again, our website is a fantastic resource um, for you to have and to share with others. Um, we also provide lots of educational webinars, such as the one that you're in today. Um, and we're um, super excited to share those. We do regional roundtables. Um, and we also have a, um, many other substance use topics um, as well. Our website also has um, all of our toolkits um, online as well. And so um, please take a look at those. Um, we have toolkits um, covering all sorts of substance use disorders um, and other, other great, um, great toolkits for you as well. And we do have a hepatitis C provider on our team um, and she is fantastic. She provides um, some case consultations um, and um, just helps with diagnosis, treatment planning, and medication management with folks living with hepatitis C as well. Um, but overall, um, we want to just share that Michigan Opioid Collaborative is just a support for providers, community members, community organizations, um, and we hope that you um, enjoy our presentation um, today from Claire. And um, while Claire is getting ready, I'd love to introduce her. Um, Claire is a paramedic and harm reductionist supporting overdose response programming and research at the University of Texas at Austin College of Pharmacy's farm program. She uses her background in chemistry 
to study drug supply contamination and is currently completing graduate work in public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And we want to just thank her for her time today. Um, we are just so excited for everyone to be here. Um, we'll also let everyone know that you are probably part of a record-breaking um, event for us here at MOC. Um, and so we're just super excited that you're all here. And um, Claire, if you're ready, we can um, turn it over to you. Um, you can go ahead and, and share in advance as, it sees, as you see fit. How's this look, y'all? That looks fantastic. Perfect. Um, all right. Hi, everybody. Hi, all. How are we doing? I'm Claire, and thank you very much for being here today. Um, like, you know, um, oh, no, sorry. Uh, so like Megan said, I'm, um, I'm Claire Zagorski. I'm at the University of Texas at Austin in the College of Pharmacy. I'm in the PhD program for translational science, and I have a bit of an odd background in that I'm a paramedic and I have an organic chemistry background um, and an anthropology background. Um, so it took me a while to figure out what I wanna do when I grow up. I don't know that I'm still there, but you know, it's about the journey here. So we're gonna talk a little bit about xylazine. Um, I've been very, very, very fortunate to have been able to um, condense and collect a lot of early reports and anecdotes about xylazine in the drug supply. I'm very lucky to have connections with people on the ground in Philadelphia, and we'll talk about that significant, the significance of that more in a moment, um, who were able to give me a lot of feedback on how things are going. And then I've also been able to connect with a lot of colleagues around the country to produce scholarly work on this issue. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad to be able to kind of update us all on what we do and do not know at this point and um, some actionable things that we've been able to land on that we can roll out right now, despite the fact that we have a lot of knowledge deficits in this region. Um, so xylazine in the drug supply really started out as kind of an, an anecdotal thing. We started seeing about this early in, in pop uh, news reports, things like Vice News. Um, I, I've got to give a congratulations to Manisha, this artist, or she is an artist, but this author here was just nominated for an Emmy yesterday for a documentary she made on fentanyl. So I got to give her a shout out. Very proud of her. Um, but very recently, um, relatively speaking anyway, we've seen more and more kind of an official declaration and acknowledgement of xylazine as an emerging threat. And the big daddy of that was the ONDCP making this declaration back in April. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the heck xylazine is and what we can do with it. So uh, xylazine is a new thing for a lot of us. This is a drug that was derived from clonidine originally. Some of y'all may know what that is. It's a little more commonly used and certainly more commonly used in people. So clonidine is an antihypertensive. It's a medication we can give to people to reduce blood pressure. Um, it works as an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but hopefully not too much to the point where it gets kind of muddy. Um, so this is a medication that's only used in animals. It was initially developed to be an antihypertensive for people. This was the aim back in the early 60s when it was developed. And in human studies, they found pretty quickly that it was profoundly sedating of people uh, to the point where it didn't have a, an effectively usable therapeutic index, didn't have a good dosing range that was safe and easy to use. So it was shelved and moved over to the veterinary world where it's now used as a sedative. Um, uh, sedative and a procedural anesthetic as well for animals. And that's its only accepted use, but it is FDA approved for that. Um, well, not FDA approved, but it is approved for that use. And that's the only way in which it is properly used. Um, so we are now, of course, seeing this in the drug supply. At this point, it seems to be added um, almost entirely to heroin slash FASH, uh, which is fentanyl adulterated and substituted heroin, which is an acronym from Dan Ciccaroni, which I'm pretty fond of. Although with each passing month, I see less and less heroin. So we're getting to the point where it's really just, it's just fentanyl. Um, it's also showing up to a degree in cocaine. It's unclear at this point if that's an intentional ad or some cross-contamination. 
Uh, we do have strip tests for this, similar to fentanyl strip tests. They're pretty new. Uh, validation is still not super clear because the validation has come from the manufacturer. So far, it looks good, but we always have to take that private in-house validation with a grain of salt until we get some third-party validation. Uh, but so far, so good with the early reports that I'm seeing. They're made by BTNX, the same company that makes fent test strips that most of us are familiar with in the U.S. Um, there's also a company excuse me, in China that has made them for a long time um, because they use them there to test uh, milk from livestock before it goes to human consumption. Um, it's a lot less expensive. If you want to talk to me about sourcing those, I'll have that conversation with you. Just email me. It's, it's a little weird. Not illegal, just weird. Okay. All right. So some of the physiology here with xylazine. So um, it is best understood as a sympatholytic. So um, the uh, alpha-2 adrenergic receptors are all over the body. So there tends to be a little bit of broadness when we look at the all of the things it can do, and that can get a little hard to, to rein in. So I like to describe this pretty simply as a sympatholytic. So a sympath meaning the sympathetic nervous system, which is best known as the fight or flight nervous system. So it works on that axis. Lytic meaning breaking down, suppressing. So xylazine pushes back on fight and flight. So we tend to think of fight or, fight or flight nervous system as something that kicks in when we're scared or angry, but it actually works all the time to keep us aroused, to keep us awake, to keep our heart rate up. Um, so uh, the, some of the immediate kind of the acute effects of xylazine that we're seeing is this really profound sedation. It tends to be um, a big problem. I'm going to talk more about that later. Low blood pressure, a slowed heart rate some slowed breathing, but I'm going to get into that more, um, as well as some weakening of reflexes. That isn't quite as clear, and it's going to be one of our knowledge deficits that I'm going to discuss later. Some of the chronic things that we're seeing, and this is very much a less known domain, are these really nasty skin wounds that we've been hearing about. Um, this photo here, I promise I don't have gratuitous photos, just illustrative photos. This is a photo from Puerto Rico, which was where uh, xylazine was first seen in the illicit drug supply um, about 15 years ago is when this photo was taken. Um, and this is from some colleagues there in PR. Um, and this was someone who was confirmed to have been utilizing xylazine and a very difficult to heal wound that they encountered. Uh, we're also seeing um, anecdotally, but still pretty consistent for anecdotes, we're seeing both anemia, um, seems to be hemolytic, but the data isn't great, I will discuss that later, as well as some dysglycemia, usually hyperglycemia, and I will also discuss that in a bit. Okay, so a quick note on pharmacology. Um, like I said, alpha-2 adrenergic receptors are all over the place. They have some action in the smooth muscle. They have action in the nervous system. Um, they have a lot going on. Um, there's a lot of tissues in the body that need to get signaling from the fight or flight nervous system. So we see these receptors a lot. One of the things that is going to be a consistent theme when we talk about xylazine versus the context of drug use that we're more familiar with is that xylazine and its effects and what we see in people are way less straightforward than what we're used to seeing with fentanyl. So I'm gonna get into a little bit of that. Um, so specifically for those of you who are interested, xylazine inhibits adenyl cyclase. This is one step of one part of, uh, of sympathomimetics of the sympathetic nervous system and their role in the body, which gets really complicated. Not complicated, but it is very involved. I think it's pretty cool but whatever. Um, also for my for my drug fans, my pharma fans, um, these are the relatives of, of xylazine that are probably the closest. Xylazine was derived from clonidine. So the researchers that made it started with clonidine as their structure and worked from there. Um, so that's uh, probably what it's closest to. And that's kind of an iffy thing to say. It has relatives of um, in the sedatives, it's close to Presidac. Um, most of the overlap that we see here is in the antihypertensive world. Um, it's pretty similar to Cataprest, Aldemat, and Lucimra. And then um, um, uh, it's also close to uh, Pyzanidine, which is an antispasmodic. I haven't personally seen, but I don't think it's used too often. Anyway, so a quick note about some of the broader context because it informs a lot of what comes next. So xylazine, um, I get a lot of questions about like why xylazine. There's a lot we don't know. 
But one thing that is definitely true is that xylazine in the drug supply is a continuation of something we've been seeing for the past several years. Um, in a way, xylazine was predictable. In the last five, 10 years or so, we've seen a splintering of the drug supply. It hasn't just changed, it's splintered off into several directions. Um, so we see a splintering of MPSs or novel psychoactive substances found in the illicit drug supply, and this has been accelerating steadily. Um, and we're to the point now where even heroin is essentially gone. I believe heroin has been gone in Michigan for a while. Um, we've had it in Texas up until essentially now. Um, I'm getting data back on a project right now and finding from um, people all over Texas that it's suddenly becoming quite hard to get tar, which has been the last kind of heroin holdout in the U.S. Um, so this is a, you know, a continued illustration of that. Um, a while ago, you know, around 2000 or so, it was really just heroin out there if you wanted an illicit opioid. And that started rapidly changing. We started seeing a little less heroin and more fentanyl, less and less and less heroin, now to the point where it's essentially gone. And we have things like fentanyl, some fentanyl analogs, car fentanyl. We're starting to see novel or exceptionally rare benzos like atizolam and fluoprazolam. Uh, and now we're seeing lots of odd things with that are so brand new or so unfamiliar that they don't even have common street names at this point. Um, so I wrote a paper a couple of years ago about isotinidazine, which was a brand new thing we hadn't seen since 1961. Um, there's other nidazines, which have gotten a lot of attention in Florida. Um, xylazine is now becoming more and more common, um, along with these other oddballs like um, ortho DMST and U47700. Um, so we're kind of getting all over the place, it's getting very broad. And why is this a bad thing? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the domains of harm that we're consistently seeing within fentanyl. Sorry, xylazine. Domains of harm which we are consistently seeing within xylazine. Okay. Number one is kind of the big daddy, our wounds. Um, so this photograph is courtesy of Savage Sisters, which is a Philly-based organization, um, and they do on, um, on the ground street outreach with people in Philadelphia. Philadelphia has very much been the North American epicenter of xylazine distribution, at least to this point. So the wounds are pretty bad, and they are distinct from bacterial skin and soft tissue infections that we see traditionally. There are, of course, areas of overlap. But this is a really common thing that we started seeing over and over again. Um, I have a paper in review right now. It feels like it's been in peer review forever, but you know, that's an academic problem. Um, and one thing we're able to do is bring together several people from across the country and really come to a consensus about what we were and we're not seeing. These are the things that came out with a lot of consistency. Uh, we saw really thick eschers, which is the technical name for a scab, as they heal, like especially thick. Um, one thing that really stands out consistently is that we see these wounds show up in places other than where people inject. With bacterial SSTIs, which is skin or soft tissue infection, um, we very consistently see the infections form near the hit site, right? And so that's a pretty, you know, linear causal connection there, like you've pushed bacteria into the skin, you've caused some trauma and an infection develops there. We're not seeing that consistently with xylazine. We're seeing these wounds show up in odd places. Like this is a forearm, which certainly isn't odd for injection, but there's all kinds of stories about this, about limbs that someone has never used, areas like back that people couldn't inject in. Um, so this is an, it's an interesting finding that suggests some sort of a systemic action as opposed to one that's really local. Um, necrotic areas are pretty commonly reported. Um, I don't know how easy it is to see on this photo. If you get a little bit closer, you can see these uh, dark areas are actually black. It's not just an Escher. Uh, this individual was uh, taken in for inpatient wound care. Um, and then also before they start kind of scabbing over, they tend to be described as burn-like, kind of grainy or granular looking in appearance. Um, Excuse me. Uh, we're also seeing um, involvement of fingers and toes. So what I mean by that is seeing finger and toe loss. So fingers and toes turning black and falling off or needing to be amputated. Um, 
there are a few signs within this that suggest there's something vascular going on, like there's a loss of blood flow to tissue. Uh, the specific mechanism there isn't known. Um, a note, and I'm going to have several notes throughout this presentation where I talk about specific considerations for unhoused people. That definitely came up in the pre-submitted questions. Um, I, I will I will give a, a very large shout that secondary bacterial infections of exposed wounds like this, particularly among people who are unhoused, can't access bathrooms consistently and have to live outdoors, all but guaranteed, right? Really, really high risk for that. Um, so don't don't uh, rule that out. Don't assume that there's not bacterial infection going on. But I will say that it seems quite clear, and that's not just my opinion, that this is not consistently of bacterial etiology. Um, there's something different. And that's a big knowledge deficit right now. We really need research to figure out what specifically is different. Um, so these are probably going to be worse to heal for people with diabetes just because of how diabetes works with wound healing and infection, but we don't know that for sure. We don't have that data, but that's something to keep on your radar. If you have folks that are battling one of these wounds and have diabetes, we're going to need to be extra vigilant with them and do as much as we can to try to get their blood sugar back into a uh, good range and keep it there. Um, so I worked closely with a uh, PhD nurse in Philadelphia named Rebecca Hosey. I don't know if she's here. She's fantastic. Uh, she has spent the past 18 months or so really refining the technique of what is and isn't working in Philly. Um, a huge fan of Rebecca. Um, so this was what she came up with and what we landed on. Got some physicians to look at it. Her PI looked at it. And we, we landed on this after much back and forth as the good general pattern for treating wounds attributed to xylazine. And you're probably thinking, Claire, this doesn't look special at all. It's not, it's pretty straightforward. I think a general um, bottom line for wounds, if we're not talking about like inpatient physician directed wound care, which can get really hairy, is that simple is usually better. Um, so we have found that these wounds do respond to wound care. Um, we are also seeing people that look at these wound pictures and are like, oh my God, they kind of understandably panic and they think that, you know, we need to get really aggressive really quickly. And we're hearing about some, what sound to me like pretty early amputations um, of limbs, which is really heartbreaking and a really big move. So one thing I want to say at this point, again, we don't have great data on this, is to make sure to exhaust your wound care as best as you can before getting onto anything more radical, because it's very understandable, very human to see new severe things like this and to go a little bit into panic mode. All right, so exhaust that wound care first. We really need clinical evidence here. Um, so if any of y'all are thinking you wanna do a clinical research study on this, please, we need it badly, badly. Uh, so the general pattern, assess that wound. Photographs are great. At the very least, be able to describe it. Have a really good look at it. See what you're looking at. Cleansing, simple is better. Soap and water, warm soap, my, or sorry, warm water with mild soap is always going to be your friend. No scrubbing. Um, if you're needing, if you feel like you need to scrub, it's time to tap out and kind of ask for help. But uh, lots of vigorous physical scrubbing will remove some of the new tissue that's trying to develop and heal. Saline is also a really great option. Good old fashioned sterile saline just to rinse and get any debris and particulates out of the wound um, or some other wound cleanser that isn't medicated or especially harsh. Um, but warm soap and water and saline are always gonna be your friends. Um, for treating, we arrived upon as an occlusive ointment. So this just means an ointment that blocks um, gunk out, keeps moisture in. Um, there are a couple of good options here. A lot of people are really big fans of Meta Honey. Um, it is a little bit more expensive. And because it has honey in it, and especially in the summer months, it tends to attract like flies. Uh, so we need to kind of keep an eye out for that. Um, Vaseline, this good old fashioned petroleum jelly is also a really great option and it's really inexpensive. Um, enzymatic and autolytic agents tend to do pretty well with these wounds, but they do need to have some physician supervision. It's really important that they not stay on for more than their allotted time, which is usually 24 hours. 
Uh, so if you have folks that are unhoused and you know that it's unlikely they'll be able to remove the autolytic or enzymatic agent within the time frame, probably don't want to do that because then it kind of bends over to the other side and starts damaging instead of helping. All right, and then keep those wounds dressed. All right, so um, I have um, I have beef with hydrogen peroxide, so I just want to make sure to share my beef with y'all. Um, so hydrogen peroxide is not a good thing for wounds. I, I absolutely grew up having hydrogen peroxide put on my wounds. I'm sure all of y'all did. Um, there's something deeply satisfying about the bubbles. I get it. Um, it, it's been shown time and again that the, that hydrogen peroxide kills fibroblasts through oxidative action. So fibroblasts are the little baby cells that grow new skin. So we don't want that. No hydrogen peroxide. Isopropyl alcohol is not necessary at that point. It's not really helping anything, but it's super dry. Kind of like how you don't want alcohol in your skincare. You don't want alcohol in wounds. Um, if folks are going to be uh, really hard pressed not to pick or scratch at their wound, uh, let's figure that out. So maybe lots of good sturdy dressings that are going to be difficult to remove or to dig under. Um, we can try, you know, kind of whatever it's going to be. You can try like some ice packs to make them feel a little less itchy. Um, if there's something really super itchy about it, we probably want to check in with a physician or prescriber to just make sure there's nothing odd going on there. Um, but we really want to help people not mess with these and let them heal. And I realize that's easier said than done sometimes. Okay, a quick uh, kind of larger picture context on wounds. Um, again, these wounds are novel. They're new in a few ways, and no one likes that. It's really um, a little bit scary and unmooring to see something that you don't really recognize, especially if you're seeing lots of patients come in with them. They're also being associated with a new drug supply contaminant. Um, they're being, xylazine is being widely called the zombie drug. It's being compared to crocodile very, very erroneously. It's nothing like crocodile. Um, I deeply hate the term zombie drug. Please don't ever use that. But the point that I, the point that I'm coming to with this is that we are human. Oop, we're human and we're flawed. So we need to remind ourselves, our colleagues, that this is a good time to take a breath, look at what's in front of us, and be willing to act conservatively, if at all possible, um, because of some of the consequences that we're seeing. Um, had several reports at this point of limb amputations that seem to happen quite early. It's something that I'm working on developing into a qualitative piece, but um, it's a little rough at this point. So anyway, deep breath, no tunnel vision. Okay, again, broken skin, particularly among people who are unhoused, super susceptible to bacterial infection. So we got to be aware of that. Um, we got to, so a lot of this we're going to be super familiar with at this point because we've been dealing with staph SSTIs for eons, right? You have to watch for signs of endocarditis, um, sepsis, and those two are pretty similar in their signs. So I have trigger signs here with my folks in Austin. Um, that's what I call them. Um, because as I'm sure a lot of y'all have a similar, similar experience, we get into this push and pull between where I would love it if one of my peers would go into the ER and get evaluated. Having said that, I also realize that it's going to be an abusive experience for them. Um, and they've had abusive experiences with healthcare before and are extremely reluctant to go in. So we have to really come up with what is my absolute drop dead point at which we have to go to the ER. And even if you don't want to text me and I'll go with you sort of a situation. And these are my hardliners are my trigger signs. If it's real stinky all of a sudden, really foul odor, if anything's turning black, yeah. So rapidly spreading redness or tissue is falling off of the wound. Um, any of these are really bad signs. I'm sure any of our physicians are nodding. Um, and this is kind of my hardliner um, symptoms. So if I have someone who's super stubborn, really doesn't want to go to the doctor, I will usually be able to arrive at, a, at an agreement with them that if this happens, we're going. Um, and a lot of that is just kind of up to negotiation. And different individuals will have different kind of breaking points. So a lot of this is just understanding what you're dealing with. Again, the stigma in healthcare context is a huge problem. 
and keeps a lot of people who use drugs from ever seeking medical care to begin with. So I like to emphasize a lot of community, taking care of each other, um, trying to figure out what we can reasonably move out of the strict clinical space and into kind of a community care context. So a lot of this can be taught. A lot of that wound care that I described, pretty straightforward, right? We can teach that. Um, and I'm really big on empowering people to kind of look after one another and look after themselves as much as we possibly can. Um, so again, I teach on those trigger signs and make them recite them back to me. Um, if we have kind of some iffiness about cellulitis, which is like red areas around the wound, I'll teach them how to use a skin marker. I can give them a marker and I'm going to say, you're going to draw this line along the edge of where the red meets the not red. And if the red creeps over that line in X amount of time, you're going to text me and we're going to talk about it. Uh, we can teach on basic wound care. Um, prevention of wounds is really great. Although xylazine doesn't have a clear wound prevention um, avenue at this point. And then I also encourage a, pro a proactive development of a buddy system. So Y'all may not have the same context. And in, in Michigan, there isn't a single ER here in Austin where people consistently feel welcome to go. So one thing I've encouraged folks to do is develop a buddy. If something suddenly goes wrong and they need to go to the ER, who's the buddy that's gonna go with them to help run interference and advocate for that patient? I could do a whole other talk about that. So I'll just move forward. Claire, I'm gonna talk can a I little bit real quick. Yes. We have lots of wound questions in the chat. Do you want to hold those okay. to the end or do you want to go ahead and do them now? Uh, let's go ahead and hold them. Um, okay. Sounds good. Yeah, especially if there's a whole lot. Um, but I'm going to try to whip through the rest of this fairly quickly so we can talk a little bit more about wounds. Um, okay, so sedation is the other bigger one. So just to emphasize, this isn't like just sedation. This is, we're having lots of reports of people who can't move and are unresponsive for hours on end. This becomes a problem for a few reasons. Um, this becomes a fall risk sometimes. We are seeing people with some muscle damage from laying motionless for so long on hard surfaces. Also nerve damage for the same reason, but I'm hearing more muscle than nerve. And I've heard two cases so far of rhabdo from this exact thing. So rhabdomyolysis is not common. Uh, I don't want to imply that it is. But anytime we are beating up our muscles for one reason or another, it's a risk. So some of y'all may have heard of rhabdomyolysis in context of like CrossFit, uh, which happens occasionally. Um, but it's caused by um, severe muscle damage, muscle leaking myoglobin, and that is toxic to the kidneys. Um, so again, not common. I don't want to panic anyone, but I do. I've I've been sharing with my folks here what that looks like, just to have it on their radar because it's not subtle. So harm reduction for sedation has got to include lots of looking out for each other and moving people who are nodding for a really long time. Um, so a big issue. So sedation is going to be a really big issue for people who are unhoused, especially. So um, we've had at least one person here in Texas who nodded on a railroad track and lost their leg. Um, so sidewalks are going to be dangerous. Streets are obviously going to be dangerous. Um, they are unlikely to have a really soft, cozy place to sleep. So greater tissue injury because they're laying on things that are hard. Um, this is going to be a very linear, direct connect to a risk for sexual assault, physical assault, and theft. Um, and the paper that I've gotten review, I kind of compared it to alcohol, uh, which can also conk people out for a really long time. And these issues have been linked to alcohol intoxication for a really long time. They also just have a less consistent network of help. So we're going to miss more things. Fun reminder, housing is very literally healthcare. Um, okay. So this is another good opportunity to remind people not to use alone. So it's great to have someone around to just keep an eyeball on them. Uh, we're encouraging folks to sit or lay down when using, um, just to make sure no one is, is nodding and falling and smacking their head. Uh, we wanna watch out for friends who are nodding longer than normal. Pretty much everyone's familiar with what like a fentanyl nod might look like or a heroin nod. Uh, this is a lot longer, um, but very unlike fentanyl, People are not stopping breathing with xylazine. I'm gonna talk more about that and kind of overdose in a moment. 
Uh, so we want people to, you know, basics first, make sure we're breathing, make sure the heart rate is, you know, moving, make sure this person is pink in color or whatever appropriate skin color looks like for their skin tone. Uh, people with really dark skin, if you're a little unsure, you can check their gums and the lining of their cheek, make sure that looks pink. So if we're good there, and this is just a person who won't wake up and move for us, here are some things we can do if we don't feel comfortable calling for help. So we don't want people to nod in weird positions. So I have this photo. I'm not a fan of these cheese ball stock photos for drug use. This is my one exception because of this particular position where this person's nodded and is hyper flexed at the waist. Um, I've had a few reports of people doing this, usually on stoops, and that seems to have like maybe some vascular kinking or something. This position has been reported with both of the cases of rhabdomyolysis I heard and one of the other non-rhabdo muscle damage cases. So I'm not sure what specifically is going on there anatomically, um, but we don't want people to nod out in weird positions. Um, if what is weird, Let's go for the recovery position. That's always our friend. On the side, knees tucked up, arm under the head, just so we can't roll onto our belly. And then we want to roll from one side to the other about every two hours. That's a good nursing standard that I was able to get from Rebecca and her PI, Shoshi Aronowitz. Um, and then we can do other things to help protect tissue that's laying on hard surfaces. So we want to place padding under things that are bony, like heels, hips, the back of the head. Um, and then we also want to teach on signs and symptoms of, you know, really bad things to look out for. I've mentioned rhabdo a couple of times. Um, again, it isn't subtle. The, the muscle that is involved, which is usually in a limb, gets really swollen, really, really painful. And this is what your urine looks like. It's called uh, tea urine or Coca-Cola urine. It's brown. Um, it's quite unusual. Again, that's not common. Please don't panic, but it's a really obvious and hard to miss thing, in my opinion. Um, so most of us don't have urine that color. So it's just a good thing to mention to people. Um, okay, a quick note about these. We've seen um, some consistent anecdotes, probably what I will call them. We don't have enough to like do any kind of statistical inference at this point of these odd chronic issues, and it is usually anemia and um, hyperglycemia. So I thought this was really bizarre, and I, I really rabbit holed on this one into the literature. Um, so both of these are reported in the veterinary literature. Those seem to be a thing. They don't know why it's happening either. Um, so I'm a big fan of this article here. It's by Noah Ball and colleagues on xylazine poisoning. He did a systematic review of reported human cases of xylazine poisoning and what happened and what they did and what they tried, um, which was really illuminating because we learned that even in cases of intentional massive dosing of xylazine, um, I don't believe anyone in this review died. Um, so that's some good context to run with, um, but, um, this is kind of an acute issue, the, the poisoning. These are chronic issues, so it's really a different context. Um, again, the anemia is not, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on with the blood sugar irregularities. Um, unfortunately, the symptoms of both of these are a little vague. Um, it's things just like, I don't feel great. I feel kind of weak. Um, maybe I get cold easily. People with pretty bad anemia, sometimes their heart will skip a beat. They'll feel that. Um, so this is a good thing to just coach people to, you know, ask for help if they're feeling not great, if they notice a change in their health status. Um, we're also seeing some reports of like dulled or lost autonomic tone, um, of some people with urinary incontinence, Un unclear what's going on there as well. Again, all of this is really unclear. I think it's helpful to have on the radar, but I wouldn't necessarily expect to see it. And I don't wanna overstate my hand. We don't have a statistical connection. We don't have a smoking gun. There's no clear mechanism on this. Both of these have been reported in the vet literature. They know that it's a thing, but because of how xylazine is used in animals, it's used procedurally. So animals aren't on it over and over again it's not clinically significant to them because it resolves and then the animal doesn't get violating again, if that makes sense. So this is something we need to know more about. Um, 
So like I mentioned, the, the U.S. mainland epicenter is Philadelphia. Things seem to be dispersing from Philadelphia. Um, and I do want to mention as well that xylazine is consistently co-occurring with fentanyl at this point. I think this is a really important thing to remind people because we're going to see some weird things come of that. I fully expect that we're going to see more and more reports of naloxone resistant fentanyl. And it probably wasn't that at all. Well, it certainly wasn't that, but it was probably xylazine that these people were seeing. They were giving naloxone to someone who looked to be having an overdose and because they didn't wake up and start talking. They assumed that they were still incapacitated on fentanyl and this was some sort of horrible fentanyl analog that is resistant to naloxone. As a reminder, that isn't a thing. Um, and we need to just kind of be aware of kind of what we're seeing. Um, having said that, because xylazine and fentanyl tend to co-occur, we still want people to give naloxone if they see someone having an overdose. Uh, I don't want people to get stuck in like a cognitive rut. Um, go ahead and give them naloxone. But if we aren't seeing um, progress with this patient within about two doses, let's move on to something else. Let's get some help and let's see what else is going on. Um, this is the data on xylazine's occurrence in the U.S. Um, so this, the, the y-axis here is the number of xylazine detections, and this is year over on the x-axis. So this is 2019 over on the far end here. Um, sorry, this other, this, this uh, right-hand y-axis is percent. So as you can see, it's really taken off. This is 2014 when we first started, 2014 to 2015 when we first started to jump. Should probably move that slide. I don't like it there. Um, a quick note on scheduling and regulation. This is kind of a hot point of debate. I'm not a huge fan of this because scheduling xylazine is going to make it really hard to study. Um, this is something that's happened before, and we need to answer a lot of questions about xylazine. Xylazine also doesn't seem to be coming from the states. Um, I've spoken to one person who um, has it on good authority, and I trust this person that it's being imported by boats, like by freight from South America. So we'll see. Um, xylazine is also very widely used in preclinical drug research on animals. So this covers a lot. This covers things like cancer, dementia, COPD, um, a lot that we use some, like rodents and um, other similar animals for. So if we scheduled xylazine federally, it would throw a big kink in a lot of ongoing studies. So we got to be aware of that. Okay, overdose. This is something that I get asked about a whole, whole lot. So we're very primed for fentanyl being this acute immediate life threat. So this seems to be much more of an issue for fentanyl than xylazine. Um, so again, even in those case reports of massive intentional overdose, very few people died. I think one person, I need to double check this study. I'm sorry. Um, and because of how xylazine acts on that axis that regulates among other things, blood pressure, there's a big risk of rebound hypertension, which can be dangerous if we were to give a reversal agent kind of quickly and willy-nilly. We are so spoiled with naloxone. It is the perfect drug to just be able to give to anyone and not have to think too hard about it. The same is not true for things that would reverse on this adrenergic axis. We see this sometimes with lofexidine. This is something that is an in-hospital consideration for other similar drugs. So we're going to have to be a lot more careful about a reversal agent, um, and um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna that's one of the questions I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more here in a second. Um, again, re-emphasizing, people should not hesitate to give naloxone to people that they think are having an overdose. If they're giving naloxone as they normally would and aren't seeing progress, then we you know we need to do something else. It could be xylazine, but it could be any number of other things, right? We have a lot of knowledge deficits. We really want to emphasize this. Um, I'm a big interdisciplinary person, but I cannot overemphasize how much we need all hands on deck here to get to answers quickly. We don't know the cell level mechanism of xylazine um, outside of the sedation. That is an understood thing at the CNS. Everything else that we're seeing is a mystery. Uh, we don't know what to expect with chronic xylazine exposure in humans uh, that hasn't been studied. Uh, we need to sort out if the dysplasemia and anemia that we're seeing is actually there or if that's like a statistical artifact. 
Uh, we need clinical best practices. We need to understand what other sequelae to look for. We need to know, we need to know if there are any preventative harm reduction strategies to roll out that we just aren't seeing yet. Um, we have a lot of sociocultural and behavioral knowledge deficits. We don't understand um, sourcing yet fully. Uh, we don't understand uh, the experience, like the qualitative experience of living with this. We don't understand policy implications, police implications. There's a lot. Um, if any of y'all aren't sure what to do with your next research project, let's do this. Let's email me. We'll talk about it together. Um, so I know this is kind of a cheesy thing to say, teamwork is dream work. We really have to work together. I have been harassing pretty much everyone I know who's a bench researcher. So please do something on this because I am not an animal researcher. I am not a bench researcher. We need both of those sorted out to start getting to some um, uh, like cell physiology and mechanistic understanding. Um, that was me, but we can share my info later. Pre-submitted questions. Are there drugs that can stop a xylazine OD? Probably. Like I mentioned, we need to be careful and do research about dosing before we just kind of toss them out to the community. There are a couple of candidates. The most commonly cited ones are telazoline and yohimbine. Yohimbine is probably a bad candidate. It has a pretty uh, narrow safety profile. It's pretty hard to dose. Um, it's used in humans sometimes for erectile dysfunction. I don't know how commonly though. Um, and you probably recognize this word because it's also sold as a supplement. Um, supplement dosing, I have to put a big warning on that, is incredibly inconsistent. Um, so I know some people have been going and buying it from like GNC and giving it to people. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to live your life, but please know that there is really no regulation or oversight of supplement dosing and quality. Um, Telazoline is FDA approved. It's really only used in neonates. So we would need to sort out dosing on that. Um, and again, we have, a lot, have this big risk of rebound hypertension, uh, which can be quite dangerous depending on the patient. So we really need to sort all of that out before we get to a point where we can roll this out to the community. And again, I don't know if there's that much of a need because while xylazine is definitely sedating, it causes some bradycardia, so slowed heart rate. It isn't stopping breathing the way that fentanyl is. It's not the same acute death risk like fentanyl. Um, I do not know if xylazine has been found in the Upper Peninsula. Um, I looked last night, I couldn't find data. The way that we surveil the drug supply in the US is really patchy and not great. Um, so it's really hard to know if it's in specific communities. I have to give a shout out to Dr. Navdas Gupta at UNC. Um, this is his, the, his site, streetsafe.supply. Um, definitely check it out. He does drug checking for the community that's based on mail. So people can mail in samples of their drugs and they get um, information on what's in it. And then it's also posted for the public to see. Um, so that's a really fantastic resource. I have not specifically heard about youth using xylazine, but I'd be surprised if they weren't simply because of how much it's commingling with the drug supply. Um, I will say that I haven't heard of anyone that's seeking out xylazine on purpose. Uh, the very consistent messaging I hear is that it's not very fun. At best, it kind of extends a general feeling of a high um, when used with fentanyl because fentanyl has such a short half-life. So that's pretty much the most flattering thing I've heard about xylazine, but most people are not a fan of it. So at this point, it doesn't seem like anything people are seeking out. I don't know if that's what that you were kind of getting at, um, but, and youth harm reduction is really not my forte, so I won't pretend that it is, but I do think it's fair to give them the same kind of um, information and harm reduction strategies that we would give other people. So I think I, I talked about a few points of special considerations for unhoused folks, but this is really, really going to be key. They are, surprise, surprise, going to be very vulnerable to issues related to xylazine. Um, we need to kind of take their complaints seriously, especially if they're odd. Um, the maximum medicine is, you know, if you hear hoof beats, think horses, not zebras, right? We're seeing more zebras, I'm sorry to say, particularly among unhoused people. Um, we've got some issues down here anyway with uh, like wound botulism and pseudomonas and, and all kinds of oddballs. Um, 
And um, this is going to be a lot of messaging, a lot of messaging about rolling one another, looking out for one another, having trusted partners, having community, which again is really hard if you're unhoused, right? Um, so that is it. And I'm more than happy to, to answer some questions. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, this is fantastic. I'll just jump right in to some of the wound care questions that we got. Um, I We do have about eight minutes scheduled left in our time today. Um, so I do want to be um, just respectful of everybody's time, um, including yours, Claire, as well. Um, so I was thinking perhaps um, if folks can enter their questions in the chat, um, we could send them to you um, to answer them and we can maybe get those out to folks um, yeah, later. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Um, so the first one is just, can you clarify if the wounds are caused by xylazine use or if xylazine exacerbates existing wounds? That's one of our knowledge deficits. It's um, if you like kind of read about it in the literature, we call them like xylazine associated skin injury injuries because that isn't clear. Um, yeah. So it seems like maybe it's caused, but we really don't know. That's a big thing to say. And then are wounds in terminal area areas of circulation? So fingers, toes, nose, et cetera. Yes, but not exclusively. Um, the definitely seeing more people losing digits and toes um, in a way that suggests something vascular because that's where you know, the vasculature gets especially small, um, but not only. Um, some of the, like you saw that image there of a forearm. Um, one of the case studies that came out of Puerto Rico early was someone who liked to inject into the jugular and had a big chest wound. So it wasn't right on top of the injection site, it was nearby, um, hard to say. And then you mentioned, um the drugs coming from out of the state. The question was, are drugs coming from out of the United States or both? So um, um, like I mentioned, there's at least one person who has a trustworthy report that xylazine is being shipped in via freight from Brazil. Um, but I've also heard some anecdotal stories of xylazine being stolen from like zoos and research facilities because of how xylazine is monitored. It's not scheduled in a, I mean, it's not scheduled, but it's, um, it isn't always tracked on inventory in a really rigorous way because it isn't seen as something that has abuse potential in humans. Um, so it's a mixed bag at this point. We really need to drill down and see what what's real and what's speculative. And if there is a mix of both, kind of what seems to be emerging as the dominant one. Great, I think that led into the next, um, the question was, is it diverted somehow from the veterinarian stockpile? At least some of that was happening when we first started hearing about this. Um, there is, I think that xylazine has become more um, kind of publicly, spoken of and also some colleagues of mine started sending this around among other veterinarian circles. I know that several of them across the country like quickly locked down their in-house xylazine supply. Um, again, it's hard to know if that made a really big difference or if that was like a one-off thing that we saw that they then reacted to. <clears throat> um, just a lots of, lots of comments in the um, chat just about um access to um, safe use, um, strength access programs, et cetera, yeah. to help with. I did see someone asked about like the predictability comment. So I didn't mean xylazine specifically. I really wish that I could know what specifically is coming. I meant that that, that progression was predictable and that we're seeing more and more like deviation away from the consistent supply that we had maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, so yeah, I don't know what's specifically coming next, but having something new showing up um, is a predictable thing. Uh, and Stephanie, people don't um, seek out xylazine. They're using it because it is what is in the available illicit opioid supply. Um, so it's not that they're choosing that, it's that they need to access opioids consistently and xylazine happens to be in it, if that makes sense. 
Great. And then um, kind of an in-house question for us to be able to watch your wonderful presentation today on our YouTube channel. Um, we will kind of answer those. It, it takes us um, a week or two um, to get those up on our up on our YouTube um, page. Um, just scrolling here. What is the effect on the brain long term? Great question. Really good question. I don't know. And that's not known. Um, that's another thing that we need to to sort out. Probably, sadly, be a primate study. Um, but I think there's a lot of unknowns about um, drug use and brain effects in general. Xylazine is definitely going to change that context. Um, yep. I completely agree, Jacob. This deviation in this drug supply splintering is a classic prohibition effect from the war on drugs. Um, we're going to keep seeing that. Um, Tracy asks, is xylazine detectable on UDS? Uh, not standardly, no. Um, ERs aren't looking for it because of mostly logistical reasons. Um, you need to get like a specific strip, like a third party strip, and test for that. But in terms of standard UDS panels, it's not there yet. <clears throat> yeah, someone mentioned like up in the, where'd that go? I'm sorry. So Jonathan Morrow. So yeah, he mentioned like, we don't see wounds in veterinary context. And yes, I completely agree. Um, that seems to be a chronic use thing and or something else is contributing there. There's either some sort of synergism that we're seeing that isn't fully understood, or it's something that emerges after chronic use. Because one thing I don't know if I really discussed, um, but in animals, this is used procedurally. So um, an animal may need to be sedated to get surgery or get an implant or have a broken leg fixed or something. Um, and they'll get xylazine once to sedate them and that's it. Whereas what we're seeing with humans is repeated often daily use so unfortunately, that's a pretty different context physiologically um, and one that we know essentially nothing about. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of unknowns, um, but please do email me, Megan, um, other questions that come up, I'll get them answered and, and they can be disseminated. And thank you so much. There's a lot to say on this. So thank you for bearing with me. Wonderful. Yes, thank you. We will definitely get um, these questions. We'll save our chat. Um, so if you have some over the next minute or so, feel free to put them in and we'll give those to Claire. Claire, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you to everyone who joined us um, for this last hour. I'm sure we could have made this a two hour webinar. Um, I just want to bring attention again to the screen. If you're looking for medical professional um, continuing education credits, if you're looking for social work or MCBAP, um, please go ahead and scan the code on your screen. We will also be sending this document out um, via email to every single person that attended. Um, if you're just looking for a certificate of attendance, um, feel free to register on EADS. It's a great um, it's a great resource to have if you just look for um, attendance certificates or um, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative can also get a um, blank certificate of attendance for our presentation today um, as well. And we would be happy to share that with with, um, with folks that need it. So again, please utilize um, that code on the screen. We'll also email out the materials from today, the questions um, that we will submit to Claire for answer and um, our um, CE credit um, packet as well to everyone that has joined us. Again, we at the Michigan Opioid Collaborative want to say thank you so much um, for everyone joining us today. We hope to see you at one of our future events. Um, we have some great ones coming up next week and in the months to come. So please check out our website, um, which is www.michiganopioidcollaborative.org. And we hope to see you all soon and have a fantastic weekend. Um, the MOC team will be hanging out for just a moment. So if you need us for any reason, um, feel free to, um, to stay on and um, hopefully we can help. Otherwise, um, jump off and have a great weekend. Thanks everyone.